If you've tuned into this podcast in the last couple of months, there's a good chance you've heard me talk about how much has changed in the world of work. With so many businesses going remote, among so many other things that are happening, we're facing a lot of new challenges in the workplace for the very first time. The reality is, no one's got all the answers about what the future of work looks like. But as hiring professionals, we're really all finding our way through this experience together. And our friends over at Indeed get that. That's why they've launched Lead with Indeed, your go-to for all things hiring. So whether you're looking for virtual recruiting strategies, trusted economic forecasts and reports, or maybe just inspiration from leaders in the TA space, including content by yours truly, Lead with Indeed Indeed is full of fresh ideas for you, the people shaping the world of work. Check it out at indeed.com slash lead and sign up to get alerts and access to exclusive content. Again, that's indeed.com slash lead, L-E-A-D. Welcome to the Work Trends Podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan Ambiro. Every week I interview interesting people who are reimagining work. And be sure to check out our Work Trends Twitter chat events calendar located at talentculture.com on the podcast page. Welcome, my friends, to the Talent Culture Work Trends Podcast. You do not want to miss today's episode. We are talking about how people can actually leverage the pandemic or their unemployment to land their dream job. Yes, I know it sounds too good to be true, but just you wait. If you're one of the lucky ones whose job was not affected by the pandemic, you still may need to listen. And if you know people whose livelihoods were negatively affected, I know you're out there, you need to share this podcast with them. Remember, we're all in this together. So in researching this topic with my team, here's some information we learned. Let's start with spray and pray. It didn't work before the pandemic, and it definitely doesn't work now. Another practice that is not going out of favor is staying organized and keeping track of the companies you want to target and keeping good notes on your activity with each. And I want to cover a little bit more about keeping track of your target companies. In some sense, it's a numbers game, no doubt. So you can't just have a few. But you shouldn't have hundreds either. Also, now is the time to broaden your search parameters. I get that not everyone is open to relocation, but since most companies are offering remote work these days, you need to look outside your geographical preferences and take that deeper dive into areas you may not have considered in the past. Another important point is that probably more important now than ever is to use the network of contacts you have cultivated through previous jobs and your social media contacts. These are only my tips, but my guest today will have a whole lot more insight you need to hear. But before we get into the Q&A, let me tell you just a little bit about her. Tracy Tim is the founder of the Nth Degree Career Academy. This career academy is really cool. It's proven to create clarity and it creates the system that helps high potential professionals discover, define, and drive careers they love. I mean, we love this. What's not to love here, right? She has a degree in behavioral psychology from Yale University. She is sought after as a career expert, organizational advisor, speaker, author, you name it. She is lively. I can say that for sure. We're we're like new BFFs, by the way. I feel like Tracy and I go way back. She's enthusiastic. She's very encouraging. And she helps her clients go from being sort of in that stuck spot to being unstoppable in both their career and life. For more than five years, she has applied these lessons in her career advisory work with hundreds of people in over 100 fast-growing companies. So thank you, my new best friend, for joining us on Work Trends. Woohoo! I'm super excited to be here. We're going to have an abundance of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. And we need fun right about now, don't we? Tell me about it. Yes. I. That's the question I always love to ask people is like, when's the last time you had fun at work? Because I just get these stupefied faces who are like, oh, we're supposed to have fun? I, I didn't think that was a thing. <laughs> of course we are. We're humans after all. So listen, what's the most important thing a person can do during this pandemic 
to bounce back better, both in life and in career. I know there's a lot of you out there in the work trends community. You're sort of in that spot right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's such an interesting time, I think, because if you look at it, it is super uncommon and disruptive what we're going through. But I think it's actually just a great reminder that life is going to throw us curveballs. It just usually doesn't throw all of us the same curveball at the same time. <laughs> so, you know, it to me, it's just a really nice reminder that, hey, circumstances are going to come up. Things are going to change beyond your control. And the only thing that you can control is your level of clarity at any given time. And so one of the things that we're saying sort of in our office as a mantra is the way to win right now when there's a lot more noise, when there's higher unemployment, when there's more people applying for the same jobs, it's he or she with the most clarity is going to win because it's only clarity that will allow you to rise above the noise, speak with more confidence, pursue your next step with more certainty and really show up in a different way than the way most people are showing up right now, which is in panic and reaction mode. So I think the the number one thing you can do right now is take a step back and get super hyper laser focused on you, your unique value, your professional genius zone, and where that exists out in the professional world. And then to just pursue it with absolute clarity, confidence, and certainty. And and those are really the three C's in our office. We say them constantly. (laughs) That's really the only thing that we're seeing that's allowing people to navigate these choppy waters in a way that just has more consistent outcomes. There's something about the word clarity. I'm feeling relaxed already. (gasps) Right? I mean, uh, just let's do it together, everybody. Say hmm. the word with us out loud. Clarity. Clarity. I know, right? You know? So yeah, Megan, I mean, clarity makes us feel so good and serene, I think, because knowing is so powerful just to know something with certainty and to not question it. You know what I mean? To be all in. It's just, that's the root of, I think, most of our issues when it comes to making decisions or choices in our life is that we don't actually fully commit to our choice and we question it even though we've already chosen it. And knowing with certainty, with clarity, with confidence, what you're built for and made for and what you're pursuing eliminates that need or or even temptation, if you will, to question it. And the story I always tell people is that the reason I do this is not because I've had a perfect, like I've known since I was seven what I wanted to be. It's because I did everything wrong. And my first job out of college was on Wall Street. And I'm Catholic. So I used to actually, I, I joke that I used to use con- the confessional as free therapy when <laughs> I was first starting out. And so I would just unload all of my misery on these poor priests. And, and one guy finally was like, listen, until you know you're not going to eliminate this anxiety. It's the knowing is going to alleviate that sort of burden on your shoulders. And he's like, and then once you know, you're going to have a whole new set of problems, which is like, how do you go find it? But clarity is, it, it, it's a it's a weight off your shoulders and a confidence level that doesn't exist without it. And it's having the permission first from yourself and then from others around you to do it. Say that again. It's permission from yourself first. This is great. So I did a presentation a couple days ago for Fairy God Boss, which is this really cool female-centric online community for careers. And the very first thing that I had them do on the webinar was type into the chat an affirmation that I give myself permission to pursue my ideal career. Because I never realized how many people I could just hand deliver the proven steps to feel unstoppable again and to know your ideal career. But if they don't believe it, you know, if there's something insidious going on subconsciously where they're like, oh, I can never deviate from X, Y, and Z, or this is what people are expecting of me, or no one's ever going to hire me or whatever it is, right? And you haven't given yourself permission to prioritize your own life, nothing's ever going to change. So I'm so glad you said that. It's spot on. So we're living through unprecedented unprecedented times right now and unemployment's high. What can you tell someone out there who's struggling, perhaps, how to stand out when they're applying for a new job? Mm, Great question. So the first thing I want to tell people is to reignite their confidence that jobs are out there. There are people hiring. There are businesses that are doing well right now that need you and they need your expertise and they need your, your natural gifts and they need your awesomeness. So just because unemployment is high does not mean that there are not jobs to be had, first and foremost. And we're seeing this consistently right now. So what helps our graduates from our program stand out the most to me is 
a depth of knowledge into their own value as professionals. So it's one thing to tell a prospective employer, I want this job, I need this job, I can do good, you know, I can do well here, um, you should pick me. And it's another thing to have a Rolodex of proof that you can go to at a moment's notice to speak to how and why you are the best choice for a job. Right. So if they're asking you about, you know, your previous work experience or your education and how that's relevant to the role, knowing how every single job you've had in your past can add even one piece of value, one little nugget of knowledge, one little skill set, one addition to your expertise gives you the confidence to stand out when you're answering those questions and you have more robust answers. Right. It's not just, yes, I can do that and I'm a hard worker. It's, yes, I can do that and I'm a herb worker and here's all the proof that's in the pudding, if you will, of how and why I am the best choice. So, you know, I hate to oversimplify it and keep going back to our magical word, but it is clarity and it's the appreciation of how your previous experiences overlap with your natural gifts and personality and how that's highlighted by your values. And if you can bring that whole value stack into that conversation, our clients are not only standing out, they're getting like competing offers for jobs. They're getting raised They're getting more time off. They're getting better benefits. And you can only do that by really articulating a good value proposition. I think if you're out there and you just heard the word Rolodex, you might be doing what I did going, is she talking about references? What are you talking about, Tracy? Come on. Rolodex. Isn't that funny that that's like not even a thing? I bet anybody under 20 is Holy going, Holy old school, Batman. I don't know. I, so by Rolodex, I, I simply mean a body of knowledge or proof that you actually can do what you say you can do. So I'll give you an example. We had a client who we worked with a couple of months ago and her big complaint was that she had reached what felt like kind of a plateau in her career. She loved her industry. She liked the job she was doing, but she knew she had more to give. She had untapped potential, but she had lost confidence in her ability to continue progressing because she had been passed over for a couple promotions and she had applied for a job internally and didn't get it. And so that just co-creates a cycle of, you know, the more you're turned down, the less confident you are, the less confident you are, you don't show up confidently. And so you get turned down again. And so it was this this horrible cycle. So what we actually did was we sat her down. This was the most, probably the most important part for her in the process. One of the, we call this part in our process nurture. So we had her write down every single job she's ever had, every single educational experience she's ever had. So degrees, certifications, any sort of formal and informal learning experiences. And then what we call your ninja skills. So that's if you've traveled, what did you learn? If you have hobbies, what are they? And why are those your your hobbies? Do you volunteer? What are your extracurriculars? What do you do because you just love doing it? How do you spend your time when nobody's telling you what to do? And so we literally forced her to look at every single one of those experiences and ask some really insightful questions. What did I learn from this experience? experience? What can I use going forward because of this experience? What about this experience made me a more valuable employee or a more valuable professional or allowed me to provide more value to the business that I was working for. And once you've done that for every single job you've had, for every single piece of education you've experienced, for every single life experience that was big and meaningful, you have a huge data set to draw from when somebody asks you, why should we pick you? Or why are you applying for this job? What makes you think you'd be a good X, Y, and Z, you know? And for her, it was finally every one of those data points gave her more confidence. She had just forgotten how valuable she was. And I kid you not, Megan, she worked with us for 30 days, graduated. She had two competing job offers within two weeks, got a $14,000 raise. And the most impressive part is probably that the jobs that she ended up applying for and getting competing offers for were one and two levels above the roles that she had been pre- previously passed over for, right? So that's what confidence can do, you know, but I would say most of us are not incredibly self-confident. We're confident from data. It's information that gives us confidence. So if you haven't done the work to know the information, but you're asking yourself to be really confident in interviews, you know, you've, you're not ready. Exactly. You've put the cart before the horse. So that's your Rolodex, if you will. It's, it's your, your bank, you know, your, um, 
store of value that you can call on at any given time, whether you're doing an informational interview, you're in a proper interview, you're applying to a job, you're writing a cover letter, you know, those are the data points that really move the needle in those conversations. So Tracy, what's step one in knowing how to get the job and not just a job? Like how does somebody fight the urge? And this has happened to me before and all of us, right? Probably from time to time. How do you stop that urge? Not just taking that first job that's offered to you. Very tempting. So I'll, I've said it once and I'll say it again. I'm not a clarity expert or career coach because I've done everything right and I have this wonderful illustrious career. It's because I've done everything wrong and I can shine a light on all the pitfalls because I've done it. and hopefully help you avoid it. So what you're talking about, I've done. I had quit Wall Street. I had sort of figured out what my niche was. I was pursuing it. And yet all these external voices and even my internal doubts and fears were saying, you need to get a a nine to five. You need to have a salary. You need to get dental insurance. You know, like all those things that just eat away at us. And we think, okay, it's, you know, I got to be a grown up. I got to do the responsible thing. I ended up taking the first job that I was offered and it was horrendous. It was a horrible fit for me, a horrible fit for them. And I ended up getting politely asked to part ways, if you will. I got fired. And that's what really lit a fire under under my butt, for lack of a better term, because it was a moment where I finally realized I can't just keep doing things because of what other people expect or because I'm afraid, because clearly that's not a recipe for success for Tracy. (laughs) That may be something that someone else can sustain, you know what I mean? For longer, but it wasn't creating sustainable success for me. So I had to decide, all right, what is more important than fear? What is more important than other people's opinions and doubts? What is more, you know, what is more important than the the things that were motivating me to make that decision? And I think that's probably step one for most of us is we have to look objectively at our lives and decide now or, you know, if not now, when is what I ask people all the time. We have to choose ourselves and choose our purpose and choose to pursue something that's ideal. And you're the only one that can do that. You know, and for some of us, it's going to take getting to a point of misery where you can't keep going any longer. And that happened to me, too. That's when I quit Wall Street. I was at my like mental and physical low of my life, probably. Time for a change. Yeah. So I know this is maybe I I always whenever I talk, I try to this is something they taught us at Yale. It's like try to immediately think of what the naysayer would say or like, what's the opposite of what you're about to say? And so I get that people out there are like, okay, just choose, you know, (laughs) I just have to decide. And if that if it were that simple, I would have done it already. But the reality is you're going to keep making the same choices and living in the same patterns until you make the conscious decision to do life differently. And it's going to be scary. It's ju- it's just going to be scary. But for me, I'll tell you that the ultimate motivator for me is that I want to live a life that has as f- few regrets as possible. And I regretted taking that job because it was the safe thing and it was the smart thing. And it was the thing that nine times out of 10, probably 25, 26 year old Tracy would do it again. But when I look at my life now, I think about, let me, let me tell you a little, little psychology that I learned. I think you'll love this. When I quit my Wall Street job, I went on semester at sea, which is an undergraduate study abroad program, but I was 25. So I was a post-grad, if you will. And I met a professor there who taught uh, social psychology. And he's like, Tracy, listen, There are only two things that you can regret in this life. You can regret, and this is what the science says. This is like the actual study of regrets, right? You can regret something you did and you can regret something that you chose not to do. And that's it. So you can regret doing and not doing. So so doing or omitting, if you will. And the way that the brain works is that when you do something that you regret, so you've done an action, there's a consequence, it's bad, whatever. The good thing is that there's an end to that story. There's a, a closed loop if you will, right? So there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so the brain is like, great, let's not do that again, but at least it's resolved. You know, I can I can wash my hands of it. What happens when you choose not to do something is that we are biologically hardwired to get to the end of the story, to know what would happen, to alleviate fear, right? To, to keep us safe. And so when you choose not to do something, you literally have an infinite number of potential ends that you'll never actually see. You'll never actually know what would have happened, but But that doesn't keep your brain from asking that question. And it's those regrets that haunt us. It's, I mean, it's the what ifs, right? It's the shoulda, woulda, couldas. It's the, wow, if I had just said, I love you, if I had just quit that job, if I had just submitted that application, if I had just written that letter, you know, whatever it is, like what would have happened? And so I decided 
after hearing that, that scared the crap out of me, by the way. I was like, oh, geez, like you mean I could regret not doing something forever? And he's like, yeah, pretty much. So to me, that's riskier than leaving the job that you tolerate. It's staying and then wondering later on, what if I had taken that? What if I had really given that side hustle my all? You know, what if I had really listened to that mentor who said, it's time to jump. You got to do it. You're never going to have the perfect time. What if I had invested in myself? It's those things to me are the thing you have to choose that's more important than your fear. And for all of us, it'll be different. But for me, it's the no regrets and the fact that I could draw my life out 20, 30 years into the future and see that I would still be miserable. And that was scarier than leaving. You know what I mean? Big time. So Tracy, you know, I have some friends right now who they've got gaps on their resume. They're really struggling with talking about what's happened in the past two years, which is a whole lot of nothing in terms of career movement. They've kind of stagnated and they're not sure how to present themselves. What would you say to my friends and those in the community here who are in that same position? Who? This is a really good question and a really unique twist on like what to do with a hole in a resume, right? So first and foremost, I think you want to figure out why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. So if you feel stagnant, that's a very specific feeling, right? It's it's different than feeling miserable. It's different than feeling underappreciated. It's, it's different than a lot of things that we hear from our potential clients. The key is to figure out where that feeling is coming from. Do you feel stagnant because everyone around you is progressing in an area that you're not? Do you feel stagnant because you literally haven't worked in X period of time and you don't have any outlet for your energy and your creativity? and your intellectual curiosity, you know, what's fueling that sense of stagnation? And I think the word stagnant too, since you used it so specifically, to me that that's a sense of like, I'm not going anywhere and something's in my way. Something's keeping me from moving forward. So maybe that's the second question, right? It's okay, why am I feeling this way? And then what's standing in my way? Am I stagnant because I don't know what I want? Am I stagnant because I'm a mom for the first time and I just don't have any outlet professionally and I feel like I'm torn between my two responsibilities? Am I stagnant because I know I'm made for more, but I've been passed over time and time again. And so I've lost my confidence. We all have those. And you tell me if, if you think this resonates. Like I think at those times when I've felt stuck and stagnant it's because I felt like there was something insurmountable in my way of moving for you know moving forward yeah I mean I'm just gonna say I think yes but I also think it's a very practical question in that how do you actually explain okay so you go through the self-discovery great but how are you then translating that in the corporate world or beyond right to why you haven't really been doing anything, or at least it's not represented on your resume. Because there's that reality. I mean, you and I can talk because we're both, you know, we're both business owners, frankly, right? But I'm talking about mass amounts of people right now who are not working, and they're in a bad place. Number one, they have to feel more secure and have that knowledge of themselves. But what do we say? Like any insight? And I mean, I know you're really well connected. And what are people saying out there, right? What stories are you hearing of others who are going through the same thing? Mm -hmm. I just talked to a woman this morning, actually, who's been out of work since June, very directly due to COVID. She lives in Brooklyn. She's okay, like from a financial perspective, has a spouse. And so they had a, you know, dual income and got it. So the interesting part, I'll tell you, is that it goes back to the permission piece for her. She hasn't really been giving herself permission to prioritize career. She's been explaining it away by, oh, I got to help my kids with their learning from home or, oh, I've got to support my husband or whatever. So that's a totally different set of things. But when you're, I think when you're trying to come back, back from a gap, no matter where that gap comes from, your job is to craft a compelling narrative that doesn't necessarily explain away or negate the time that you took off, but helps this employer, let's say that you're telling this narrative to, know what you did with that time while you weren't working. Basically, I think we we think it's really easy to think linearly or black and white or all or nothing. And so to us, a gap in a resume looks like nothing. But I guarantee you, this woman I talked to this morning, she literally called herself. She's like, I'm a professional webinar attendee and I'm currently reading five to six books at a time. She is shoring up her professional value as she's looking for a job. And so one of the most compelling things I think you can do when crafting your narrative is look really objectively at what you have been doing to shore up your professional 
let's say skills, knowledge, expertise, prowess, whatever you want to call it, even though you haven't been working. So have you been volunteering? Did you discover a new passion? Did you have any uh, meaningful life experiences that have taught you a new skill? You know, have, what did you read? What did you consume? Like the big temptation here that companies will think is like, okay, this person has no drive, has no work ethic, took all this time off or can't get a job, right? Like we're, we're telling ourselves those stories, assuming that that's what the person listening to us is thinking. And so it's your job as the, the asset right? You are the asset to make a compelling case and craft a narrative that looks good for you. (laughs) Not just allowing your resume to speak for itself and then allowing whoever's listening to make their own inferences. Does that make sense? I love it. It's all about the narrative. It's all about the narrative. Practice the narrative. I told this to a guy um, a couple days ago who I'm working with. He's he's like 22, 23 years old, really wants to get off to a good start in his career. He uh, graduated from a private liberal liberal arts university and all of his buddies are like going into finance and consulting, right? And now they're all miserable. And he's like, I knew I didn't want that life. So I decided not to. So he's, he's kind of doing, um, his dad owns a business. And so he's working for his dad's business in the interim until he figures out what he wants to do. Sweet. Uh, right. I know. I was like, what a great little gravy train that is. But while he and I are working together, what he, he keeps focusing on is he's like, okay, I want to apply for this job. How do I change my resume? And I'm like, you're so young <laughs> and inexperienced that you're not going to win the resume game. There's no scenario where your resume is going to be the reason that you get this job. It's just not because it doesn't tell as good of a story as you, as who you are. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And I love this. These are tangible takeaways. And it really does point back to knowing thyself so thyself can get out there and tell that genuine story, whatever that is. And you know what? Again, Tracy, if it's not the right fit, it's better in the end for both parties. Don't waste your time. People hire people. They don't hire resumes. I couldn't agree with you more. And to that end, what I told this client of ours was, what is your best medium where you can look better than anybody else? You, like you need to look like the best choice, right? And so if you're just relying on your resume to make you look like the best choice, but in reality, you're, you're never going to have the best resume because maybe you've had a gap or maybe all of your previous experiences in one industry and now you want to make a shift or for whatever reason, your resume is not going to be the thing that gets you the job. I think you just have to own that and then pick a better medium for him. I know this might sound cheesy or whatever, but I was like, Jake, you show up so confidently in person. You should record a video and say why you're perfect for this job. Nobody else is going to do it. And you're articulate. And that's going to make you stand out as a candidate. It's going to show, you know, there's all these good reasons to do it. But it's like you said, crafting your own narrative and then choosing a medium that's going to give you the best chance of looking like the best choice. Tracy, I can't believe it, but it is crystal ball time. Means that, you know, time flies when we're having fun, right? So talk to us. I know these are uncertain times, but what do you feel is next in the future of work? What should we be looking to? Any predictions? Ooh, what a fun question. I'm going to give it a little narrative to give my answer. So uh, when I was on Semester at Sea, I got to meet Jeff Hoffman, who's actually the co-founder of Priceline. And he told us this story about how he and his partners came up with the idea for Priceline. And it was basically he would get online every morning and he would just troll general news and just see like what was going on in the world. And he has this brain where he can kind of like, I guess one of his strengths is probably connectedness. He can sort of see how disparate parts come together in a way that's beneficial. And so it was literally, he was reading about like food shortages and how if a piece of food goes bad before somebody buys it, nobody can buy it and the farmer loses out. And he literally applied that to the world of, in this case, let's say aircraft. So as soon as a plane takes off, you can no longer sell that seat. You lose out on that revenue. And he was like, huh, why don't we discount it? You know, like he literally just started putting all those pieces together. And I remember sitting there going, wow, I wish I had that gift. You know, I, I wish I had that gift of knowing better and seeing trends and seeing one step into the future that no one else can see. So I'm going to throw myself under the bus and say, this is a tough question for me to answer. But you know what, Tracy, you're being true to yourself. I am. And you know what? We like that about you here. So, you know, your answer could be, I don't know. So my answer is probably I don't have a really well-founded, well-researched answer. 
answer, but my gut tells me that in the future, the importance is going to be on evolving your purpose and your professional value add, your niche, if you will, as you evolve and the world evolves. So I'm probably not the first one to say like the ability to change and adapt in the future is going to be the highest skill set over and above having any particular hard skill. But the thing that that we really, I really think this is what the majority of people who rise above the average, who have long-term sustainable success, who feel like they've reached any part of their potential, I think that they're the ones who, no matter what's going on in their life and what's going on in the world, they routinely and consistently take a step back and reevaluate their next best step meaning they're consistently intentional and proactive in their lives as opposed to riding the conveyor belt or the roller coaster that they're on and being reactionary or responsive. So I see a world where they say that like 10 years from now, 50% of the jobs that people are going to get hired for like don't even exist yet or some crazy stat like that. So I think that the future of career is going to have a lot more to do with your ability to evolve and evolve in the moment than any particular industry or skill set or technology being like the go-to thing that everybody has to learn and know. And then I also think that we're going to have a rev- like a reversion back to wanting to be humans. <laughs> Meaning like, I'm so over Zoom. I'm over it. I'm over it. And the people that are that are logging into webinars that I do these days are way less engaged. They're tired. So I think we're going to get people back. I love it. Hey, Tracy, Tim, thanks for being born and stopping by here. We appreciate you. Oh my you. gosh, you're amazing, Megan. I love your attitude. I love what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm really appreciative for the platform. And I hope one little nugget lands with somebody out there and it's and it's beneficial. If you enjoy listening to the Work Trends podcast, go ahead, share it with your friends and colleagues so they can stay current on what's happening in the world of work. And be sure to listen to our next podcast when I'm going to be speaking with somebody very interesting. Catch up with you next time. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, and iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time. <laughs>